So as promised, today I would like to totally demystify worker co-ops for those of you who are unfamiliar with them. We're going to go through some extensive research, some extensive uh, studies, uh, meta-analysis of worker co-ops, how they stack up against traditional businesses. And at the outset, let me just explain what is a worker co-op? What is a democratically run business uh, firm? Well, in traditional top-down businesses, you have a manager, you have an owner, you have a board of directors, you have a capitalist, right, who gets the money together, and then they purchase the labor. Okay, they let's say you want to start a donut shop. Uh, you have all of the money to invest in the shop, and then you buy the labor. You say, okay, I'm going to hire these 10 people. I'm going to hire them at $8 an hour, and uh, you work for me. You do virtually everything I say, and when we make profits, uh, I get a large, you know, a large portion of the profits. It goes into a bank. It goes into my checking account. Uh, oftentimes, CEOs of businesses and, and board of directors, they... They make money based on the stocks and how the stocks are doing of the company, if it is a publicly traded company, and they make a, a larger share of the profits than does, a, obviously, a typical worker. In some cases, they make 100 times, 300 times, even 1,000 times more than the typical worker at the company, and they really get to decide what the workers paid, how the job goes, you know, what kind of uh, resources are allocated, what they, they produce. So they make all of the top-down hierarchical decisions of the company. And worker co-ops simply set out to say, okay, well, let's return that power to the workers. Let's have workers own the company. So each worker has a share in the company. They get a, a stake in the decision-making of you know major decisions that affect the company. However, there can still be management, right? You can still have a manager who may make, let's say, five times or six times as much as the lowest worker, but not 100 or 200 times. And those managers, they, they go through performance reviews from the workers where the workers routinely, they can, in, in some respects, vote on who they want the manager to be. So if the manager is doing a good job and get good performance reviews from the, the general workplace, then they may stay a manager for a long time because they're doing a good job. However, we meet you know at the end of the year and let's say uh, this person's been a real dick to the employees. He keeps turning the thermostat off uh, without you know everyone's consent and you know, it's getting really hot in here. It's like 95 degrees in the summertime and he's just ruthless, right? And everyone's like, I don't really like that manager. I want Susie to be a manager. Hey, why don't you run for the manager position? And then we vote on it, okay? But there there can still be management positions. It's just that everyone has a stake in the company. They have a share in the company. And when we have profits at the end of the year, those profits in some respect are redistributed down uh, to the employees, so in the form of, you know, regular raises or, or what have you, okay? So there's there's various different contractual ways to set this up. But broadly speaking, a worker cooperative is a company in which the workers have some say in uh, the organization. They have a share in the company or, you know, a, a share of ownership in the company, et cetera. Let's dive into the statistics on this. Well, the studies on this. The, I've got meta-analysis here. I've got, uh, first, I'm going to read you the summary of an article published in the Institute of Study of Labor in Germany by Douglas Cruz. The accumulated evidence on the economic performance of firms that have employee ownership gives no reason to think that performance would be hurt and in fact suggests that performance may be enhanced. Not only is employee ownership linked to higher company performance on average... But it may also add to worker pay, employment stability, and company survival. The free rider and financial risk problems are important, but the evidence indicates that they can be overcome. Apart from benefiting companies and workers, the findings point to the potential for employee ownership to increase economic stability and reduce unemployment and inequality in the overall economy. But... Let's not take this supposed expert opinion at face value. Today, I'm going to dive into a multitude of studies, okay, and demonstrate the conclusion from an evidence-based case that democratizing the workplace is totally necessary and is actually a good idea. So, firstly, I have a study that looked at innovation, the capability of management and innovation under a cooperative business model. Um, they looked at firms in the Basque region, which has a large amount of uh, cooperatives that are under kind of a, a federalized structure, uh, you know, co-ops, a bunch of smaller co-ops that are linked together. Uh, there's one entity called the Mondragon Co Corporation that a lot of people that talk about worker co-ops discuss because it's one of the probably the best examples because it is so big. It has, I think, 80,000 employees at this point. So 
This study found that Basque industrial cooperatives are in a situation of competitive parity to investor-owned firms, traditional firms, and don't differ in management and innovation capabilities. So that's pretty cut and dry. Um, basically, a lot of people make the case that, well, the fact that a CEO or you know, the, pe the owners, the managers, the fact that they make 100 times or 300 times more than the typical worker, that is a structure that drives innovation. And that's the reason we see so much innovation in the marketplace. But this study does not conclude that. It doesn't find any difference in, in innovation, any qualitative, measurable difference. Let's move on to productivity. A meta-analysis on participation and productivity in labor-managed firms and participatory capitalist firms found that profit sharing, worker ownership, and worker participation in decision-making are all positively associated with productivity. This is a big one. This is something that they repeatedly find, is that workers having a say in their own jobs and having agency and getting to having decision-making in uh, the type of work they're doing, having autonomy, it has a large benefit. They, they end up being more productive. They, they're more engaged with their work. And uh, another meta-analysis on employee ownership and firm performance found that employee ownership has a small but positive and statistically significant, I believe it was a 4% uh, difference, relation to firm performance. Statistically significant, positive relation to form, firm performance. But worst case scenario, I've seen studies where there's no difference. Worst case scenario, there is no difference. Best case scenario, there is a statistically significant difference. Positively, in the positive direction. This is solid. And let's move right on to employee satisfaction because I think this is the most important point. Our workers who have a stake in the means of production, have a stake in the companies that they work at, have a, a, de a decision-making say you know, can do perform regular performance reviews of their own managers, are they more satisfied with their work? Are they more happy? So an another more experimental analysis concluded, and I have a graphic for this one. In our experiments, subjects in employee-owned firms exhibited higher productivity, perceived greater fairness in the pay they received and the method used to pay them, reported higher levels of involvement in their tasks, had more positive evaluations of their supervisors, and showed a greater propensity to interact with and provide assistance to their co-workers than did those in employee-owned firms. So if I didn't say this before, all of these studies will be linked in the description section below when I publish this video, every single study, and you can go read them. Let's move on to survivability. This is a big question, you know. Sure, these sound good on paper, but long term, how do they survive? I mean, how do they do in economic downturns? Certainly a, a traditional corporation that's top-down, hierarchical, one guy's making decisions, he can act in a moment's notice. Surely they should perform better in, in times of stress. They should uh, they should have a better chance at staving off the recession and, and not going bankrupt. Well, turns out this is not the case. Here is a battery of studies provided by cooplaw.org that I'd like to evaluate with you. Let's go over to resilience of cooperatives generally. So you may not trust this source. It's cooplaw.org. But just in case you don't trust them, I have another study that they didn't link here that I'm going to go over that's totally independent from this. And all of these studies they're providing are also independent. It's not like they hired these, these studies or they funded these studies. They're just you know, putting them front and center, putting them in one curated list. But there appears to be a consensus among studies in a number of countries that cooperatives are more resilient than conventional businesses. Recent Canadian studies. Cooperatives in British Columbia being between 2000 and 2010 had a five-year survival rate of 66.6%. The devil's number. 100 out of 150. Compared to a conventional Canadian business which had... 43% and 35 or 39% five-year survival rate in 1984 and 1993, respectively. Now, I do see one issue with that, though, because one is between 2000 and 2010. That's a different era. One is between 1984 and 1993. So that's a little uh, wonky. We've got more to move on to. Moving on to the second one, Alberta cooperatives created in 2005 and 2006 had a three-year survival rate of 81.5% compared to 48% for conventional businesses in that province. So this is comparing the exact same time 
and they still did better. A 2008 study in Quebec showed that co-ops had a five-year survival rate of 62% and 10-year survival rate of 44% compared to 35 and 20% respectively in other Quebec businesses. In 2012, a study by the European Confederation of Worker Cooperatives, blah, 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 found that worker cooperatives and social cooperatives in Spain and France have been more resilient than conventional enterprises during the economic crisis. Cooperatives in Italy have shown a lower mortality rate and incidence of bankruptcy than conventional businesses. In 2005, 1% of German businesses were declared insolvent, but the statistic for cooperatives was less than 0.1%. So... This is telling. This is a battery of studies. But again, in case you don't, you're not feeling these, let's go straight on to another graphic. Still another study concluded that while employee ownership is associated with higher productivity, the greater survival rate of these companies is not explained by higher productivity, financial strength, or stability, suggesting, or compensation flexibility, my bad. Rather, the higher survival rate is linked to the greater employment stability, suggesting that employee ownership companies may provide greater employment security as part of an effort to build a more cooperative culture. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is fairly overwhelming. Cooperatives are a brilliant business model. It's, it's really fascinating stuff. And let's go ahead and talk about the policy approach to this. How do we incentivize worker co-ops and uh, make them competitive in the marketplace? And they already are competitive when they're started, but there are significant barriers of entry. There's barriers to starting a co-op. That's the hardest part is getting a cooperative off the ground because uh, it, it's hard to get the startup capital. When you don't have one very rich, significant investor coming in, uh, when you don't have capital to leverage, uh, you know, resources to leverage, like let's say you leverage a house or something like that. So oftentimes workers, they have to come together and, and all pitch in a certain amount, right? And uh, similarly, there are schemes where sometimes workers, they will buy out a company. They'll cum cumul cumulatively buy out a company from a capitalist. And uh, there's there's policy that can that can kind of catalyze that. So let's look at the let's look at some policy proposals for how we move in this direction because going back to the summary that I read in the beginning, that actual that article had a lot of good prescriptions, a lot of interesting ideas on how to do this, how to facilitate this. And I want to run through some of them because I have my own ideas, right? I have my own theories on how this could be done, how this could be facilitated from the government's end uh, and incentivized, but I came across this list and some of them make a lot of sense. So just reading from the top, a direct tax incentive to either the employee or employer, such as the deductibility of contributions to deferred employee ownership plans in the U.S. Basically, if you invest your money in a worker cooperative and starting a work, worker cooperative, you get deferred taxes, you get a higher tax, to, you know, you can deduct that from your taxes. And it basically incentivizes starting a co-op over a traditional business because when you invest in a traditional business, that's not always, or at least it shouldn't be, dedu tax deductible. Whereas uh, he's suggesting that you give better tax deductions or a tax deduction in general for someone who does set up a worker co-op and puts their money where their mouth is in starting one. Making retiring owners... So an owner of a traditional enterprise eligible for exemption from capital gains taxes if they sell the company to an employee ownership plan. So if they if they sell out, if they sell their company and uh, sell their stocks in, in this company to the workers and allow the workers to buy it up and have a worker owned uh, system, then no capital gains taxes. You're, you're deferred. You know, your capital gains taxes are, are moot. Just keep all that money. There you go. So it incentivizes a capitalist who is retiring to sell their company to the workers and and they they gain from that you know they don't have to pay taxes on that money they otherwise would you know would make uh, or would have to pay to the government so that's a fantastic idea allowing financial firms to deduct a portion of their interest income from loans made to employee ownership firms another fantastic idea so let's say a bank a bank uh, makes a loan to a cooperative that's just starting out they would get to deduct some of the interest paid in that loan from their taxes just because they're, they're, they're loaning to a cooperative rather than a traditional business. So it incentivizes banks taking the first step in, in loaning to up-and-coming cooperative businesses. Fantastic idea. 
fantastic idea. Restricting tax deductibility of incentive pay for top executives to companies that have a similar type of incentive for all employees, as is done in the U.S. for pensions and health insurance. So basically, what this means, this one's a little complicated, but what this means is that the tax deductibility of incentive pay um, can only it can only be tax deductible if your company offers those incentives to all members rather than just uh, top executives. Okay, so if you you know let let's say you have uh, stock options, you have you know, health pensions, etc., and it only applies to the top executives. Well, that wouldn't be tax deductible. However, if you apply it to everybody, then it's tax deductible pretty straightforward. Just a little complex complex wording there. I think that's basically what they're going for. Making a minimal program of employee ownership a precondition for corporate tax incentives in the tax code. So basically straight up, uh, you have to have a certain amount of employee ownership. So let's say 40% of the employees own it. Or you have, you know, employees on the board of directors. That's that's one plan. That's what Bernie proposed recently. And in order to get these tax incentives, you have to do that. Fantastic idea. Requiring or favoring firms with broad-based ownership plans in government procurement. So basically, when the government goes out to buy things, let's say the government's buying a thousand hammers, just write into law that the government has to buy it from cooperative businesses. That's one way to really make them competitive, isn't it? Okay. Or at least uh, favoring them. Okay. So let's say we we taper it down. So this year we're going to mandate that ten percent of all uh, purchases made by the government in the private sector for, you know, goods and services and things, it has to be worker cooperative businesses. And the next year, it's 20%. And the next year, it's 30%. You just transition up to 50 or, or whatever. Uh, tax abatements to firms with broad-based employee ownership and economic development zones or social improvement projects. So again, tax incentives for doing this. Let's say, you know, you start a cooperative business and we say, okay, no taxes for 10 years. How's that sound? No taxes for 10 years because you started a cooperative business and we, we want to favor those businesses because they're just more ethical and they do better. They're better for our economy. They're uh, better poised to, to survive economic turndowns. So obviously there is relentless, solid meta-analyses, studies, peer-reviewed articles, uh, expert opinion that backs this idea that worker cooperatives in general uh, are more efficient. They're, they're, they produce on a higher level. They compete in innovation. They have higher survivability in all of the, the instances I was able to find. They have higher employee satisfaction. And we need to think about some of these ways that we can incentivize worker cooperatives in the U.S., in Europe, abroad, etc. But in my country of the U.S., yes, I want to see us go in this direction. I want to see this. I want to see this take initiative in our economy. Leave your comments down below. Please join us on Discord. Join the discussion. Let me know if there's any stories you'd like me to cover, any people that you would like me to debate. Uh, I'm going to be having Vaush Vidya of YouTube and formerly Twitch. I think he got banned on Twitch, but he is a, I believe he's an anarchist, an anarcho-syndicalist, something like that. We're going to be having a discussion, an open-ended discussion uh, soon, or at least it's, it's tentatively set. He replied to my email and he's interested, so we are currently mulling that over supposedly later in the week, I should be having a discussion with Sargon of Akkad. He commented on my video about uh, the Internet Bill of Rights, and uh, he apparently wants to come on and defend some of the points he made, I guess. I don't know, but yeah, apparently that, that might be happening, you know. Now, we'll, we'll see. He, he says so. He says he'll be free in, in less than a week, so let's see how that turns out. But don't hold your breath because... I, I could also see him backing out of it. And of course, I still have a talk with TJ, the amazing atheist in the making. So that's also coming in the near future. Let me know your thoughts and uh, take it easy, guys.